Welcome to the WRAL Daily Download. I'm your host, Ali Ingersoll. Early voting is underway across the state, and the North Carolina primary is less than two weeks away now. Today, I'm talking with WREL's NC Capital Bureau Chief, Laura Leslie, about everything you need to know to get ready to hit the polls. Thanks so much, Laura, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I really can't believe that another presidential election cycle is upon us. So for those who might not know, at the highest level, who's on the ballot right now? Well, that's interesting that you ask that, because there's people... You will see a lot of people on the ballot if you vote Republican in the primary. You'll see a lot of names on that ballot. But, of course, for the most part, all of them have dropped out except for Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. Mm -hmm. And on the Democratic side, the only choice you've got is Joe Biden or no preference. So uh, at the state level, there's pretty intense um, competition over in the Republican race for governor. You've got um, Mark Robinson, the current lieutenant governor, up against the current state treasurer, Dale Falwell, and a former gubernatorial candidate, Bill Graham, who's also an attorney. And then on the Democratic side, you've got our current um, attorney general, Josh Stein matched off against uh, retired Supreme Court Justice Mike Morgan. So those are your major players that you'll see. So how do primaries work in our state? We were just talking about this time from Pennsylvania. They work a little differently in every single state. Can everyone vote here? Do you have to be affiliated with a party? You Okay, so you can vote. Anyone, anyone can vote here. But if you are registered to a party... And you have to vote in that party's primary, right? So even if you're registered Green or Libertarian, you can't vote in the Democratic or Republican primary. You can only vote where you're registered. However, if you're unaffiliated, you can just choose whichever ballot you want to do. We want to vote. And so um, and so a lot of people do that. And so that actually it makes it really advantageous to be an unaffiliated voter in North Carolina because so many – you know, a lot of – because of redistricting and sort of gerrymandering, so many of our races are decided in the primary – that um, people who aren't unaffiliated voters don't really get to make much of a say <laughs> in any of them, right? Um, so, you know, so there is that. Um, you know, and as you say, that's quite different from, from a lot of other states. Yeah, definitely. So why does it matter the way that we do it? And also, in general, why does a primary matter? Well, as I was just saying, because so many of our districts are so lopsidedly one or the other that the race is really over at the end of the primary because there's no way the person in the other party, Democrat or Republican, has a snowball's chance of winning, right? But why it matters to have unaffiliated people in there is that they can do a couple of different things. Number one, they can tend to moderate the choices of the party faithful because normally in, in closed primaries, who shows up are the really dedicated people who really believe sort of the furthest edges of the party, right? Either way, left or right. When you have unaffiliateds, they can actually come in and sort of moderate some of that. So you end up with maybe the candidate that isn't the farthest to the wing on either side. However, unaffiliateds can also do some mischief. And this is something, this is the reason that parties like closed primaries, right? Because (laughs) if you're an unaffiliated voter who tends to favor Democrats, you could go into the Republican primaries and vote for the people that you think are least likely going to win Hmm. Um, and so give your candidate that you actually prefer an easier path to victory. Hmm. And there is some of that that goes on. And the parties often, you know, kind of refer to that and tell their people, make sure you go out because we don't want people from the other side picking our candidates. What does voter turnout look like in the primary here in North Carolina? Small. Very okay. small. Um, it is as big as it's ever going to be during um, the presidential primary. But for the most part, people don't vote a lot in primaries here. And um, and I think a lot of times they just don't realize how many, as we were saying, how many races get settled at that point mm-hmm. um, or they're just kind of not paying attention to it. But the presidential year is always the big year. But even so, if we got over – if we got north of 30 percent – I, th- I would be shocked. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, really small. Yeah. Um, and I think at this point with the presidential election being kind of somewhat decided. It seems like it's largely where it's going to be. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we did talk about some of the local races earlier uh, in this conversation. What are some of those big races that you're really keeping an eye on and why should they why do they matter? Well, you know, a lot. OK, number one, of course, the, the governor's race. But there's a lot of other races on this council of state. And those are the statewide officials that decide that kind of execute the laws that do everything from protect you from, you know, in terms of crime and safety to make sure that you can register your business and that you can pay your taxes and you're not paying too much taxes. You know, um, you've got 
you know, the, the treasurer, uh, the state auditor, the people who keep things accountable. You know, so those races are all very much in play this year because we've had a lot of people moving around. Um, for example, several people who are currently on the Council of State are running for governor. Mm. So those seats are open, right? Those are empty. So you've got a lot of people here who have never served in statewide office before. And so you kind of have to try to figure out who's going to do the best job. Um, one that we're watching pretty closely on the Democratic side is is the attorney general's race, and that's between Jeff Jackson, who's a current congressman and a former state senator, and uh, Satana DeBerry, who is the district attorney in Durham. And, um, you know, neither of them have run a statewide race before, of mm. course. Um, and so you've got the Democratic Party splitting up, factions of it, splitting up in some very interesting ways behind those two candidates. So that's that's a, a fascinating one. And on the lieutenant governor, sorry, on the Republican side, really the, you know, the gubernatorial race is the one I think we're mostly keeping our eye on. But there's another really interesting way, race shaping up for commissioner of insurance. Um, and this is um, where current Commissioner Causey is facing a couple of challengers because people are upset about these proposals to increase homeowners insurance rates so high. Hmm. So a lot at play. And we could have an entirely different looking government by the end of the year. It's going to be a lot of new faces, whatever, whoever wins. Yeah. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back. Now, Laura, as people prepare to vote, can you address some of the biggest changes people can expect to see when they head to the polls? Sure. The number one thing you need to know about is voter ID. Bring your voter ID. Um, if you lived here in 2016, um, you might have you've already had to do this once for the primary before that was put on hold. Uh, lawmakers have been trying to get this done for a while. The state Supreme Court finally sort of put it into place earlier this year or last year, actually. So, um, yeah. So if you voted in the, in the municipal elections last year, you've done this before. <laughs> but most people don't vote in those. So yes. <laughs> uh, so this will be the first time. So just make sure you've got your, your uh, driver's license with you or another approved form of ID. If you don't have it with you, you can still vote. Uh, you'll have to sign an affidavit and either bring your ID to the Board of Elections within 10 days, like basically before 10 days after the election, or you can simply attest as to why you don't have one. But that will make your – either way, that's a provisional vote, and it might not get counted. Hmm. In North Carolina, can people register to vote the day of? Like how – do you already need to be registered at this point? Um, no. Actually, until the end of early voting, you can register and vote on the same day. Um, now, you have to bring – it's more than just your ID. You've got to bring some several documents with you. There's lots of information about that on the Board of Elections website. But we have what's called same-day registration. So you can go in, prove your address, you know, sign all the paperwork, and then you can cast your vote that day. However, that ends at the end of early voting, which is March, March 2nd. Okay. On Election Day proper, March 5th, you cannot register to vote and vote that day. Okay. So people can head there today and then go and do that. They can. Um, and then another change, poll watchers, right? So what exactly is going on with poll watchers this year? Well, we've had poll watchers for a long time in North Carolina. And for the most part, they're just people who are appointed by their party to kind of keep an eye on things at voting sites and make sure that things are going smoothly, laws are being followed, et cetera. That um, all went along pretty you know, pretty much under the radar until 2022. So after the 2020 elections, when all the rumors of election fraud in Stop the Steal were going on, there was a huge surge in interest in serving as poll observers. And that led to some problems in the last primary uh, because we had poll observers doing things like interfering with voters and harassing officials and following the officials home in their personal cars mm -hmm. and things like that. So the State Board of Elections tried to step in and make some rules for how what, what poll observers could and couldn't do. Uh, that ended up in um, in a legal battle. And this this last year, the state uh, basically legislature stepped in and made some rules for it. So the poll observers will now be able to get closer to you. They'll be able to listen to what you're saying, for example. Mm -hmm. They'll be able to wander around behind you as you're voting. But they're not allowed to look at your ballot and they're not allowed to be by the tabulator when you're putting your ballot in because they're not allowed to see how you vote. And they can't photograph or record you without your permission. But they can certainly um, you know, be much more active in the voting enclosure area to see what's going on and make sure that they you know, can be assured that there's no wrongdoing happening. Uh, are you hearing anything from people who have already voted about being uncomfortable with that or anything like that? You know, I haven't. And the thing is, it's just started. And poll observers aren't at every poll. I mean, you know, um, for example, there's a list of like 200 at-large ones that basically can go to any polling place in the state 
because other ones have to be they're site specific or they're county specific. But these guys, but as you can imagine, with that many people and that many voting sites, they're not going to be able to be at every voting site. Yeah, you know. Um, so you, you know, it kind of depends. We didn't have very many problems with them here on the Triangle at all. Some of the places that they had problems with them in 2022 were more rural places. Wayne County was one example that I seem to remember, and there was another one that was out west. Okay. So recently you you reported that lawmakers could possibly tighten our state's laws even more this year when it comes to voting. What exactly are they proposing? Well, one of the proposals is shortening the amount of time that we have early voting. And legislators tried to do this a few years ago, but that case, that law got overturned in court. And that would have shortened the early voting time from 17 days to 10. Now, um, if you go back and look at the documentation, I don't think there was a huge difference, but I think that was during a primary, if I remember correctly, so it might not have told the whole story. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, they're saying, well, it's very expensive because we have to man all these sites for all these hours and candidates have to stand around for all day for 17 days of early voting. And it's, it's like it's not about the candidates, guys. <laughs> you know? But anyway, sorry, I digress. Uh, but they're talking about that and they say, you know, because there's, there's such a kind of a lull. There's a rush at the beginning. There's a rush at the end. There's kind of a lull in the middle. And what if we could just cut out some of those days in the middle? So that is an option that they're talking about, although I don't get a sense that that's got a ton of interest yet. And North Carolina is really not an outlier in terms of our amount of time. We're pretty close to. We're on the more generous side, but we're nowhere near the most generous when it comes to early voting time. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing they're talking about possibly is they're trying to kind of they're very concerned about what they consider to be a loophole in same day registration, which is uh, if you go to same day registration and you vote and they send you a postcard to confirm your address, if it comes back undeliverable, then they have to send you another postcard. And by that point, they could be counting your ballot, Mm. even if your ballot's not valid. Right. On the other hand, sending it once you run the risk of the post office misplacing it. I mean, I get my neighbor's mail all the time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I know I know for a fact this is a thing. And so a court recently said, well, yeah, you can't do that because you're not giving them a chance to, to come back and say, hey, I do live at this address. There was a mail problem or there was a transcription error when you wrote down my address or mm-hmm. whatever. So I think they're going to be trying to work out a way to um, to work that out because there's a lot of concern that people could use this as, you know, as a way to, to – defraud the election, although there there's really no proof that that's ever been a problem. Yeah. I feel like for a lot of people, elections can be really overwhelming, especially if you don't follow politics as closely as you probably do, which is really not many people. It's still overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we here at WREL, we have a really useful voter guide on our website where you can enter your address. It populates information about all of the candidates who will be on your ballot that day. Why is something like that so critically important as someone heads to the polls? Go and look at this. I mean, I do my homework, right? I go look at my ballot before I go because... Because there's going to be people on there that I, even I don't know very much about. And, you know, I, nobody likes to go in there and have a choice between two names and you don't even know. Mm-hmm. Right. And then you're going to waste your vote by not voting. You know, so it's just better to go before have a look before you go and figure out who these people are and figure out who you want to back. Yeah, I think it's just so interesting that we put this together and so useful. And you can check out that uh WREL Voter Guide on our website at WREL.com. Laura, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for listening to the WREL Daily Download. If you listen to this podcast on WREL.com or on our news app, you can also find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Follow the show so you don't miss an episode. Thanks for listening. 